Hi, my name is Tanya Parker, and I'm currently serving with Jenna Heiss as one of the co-coordinators of the Suicide Prevention Office for the state of Texas. One of the goals for Texas is to develop zero suicide communities to help save lives. So what does that really mean? And how do we plan to accomplish that goal? It means that everyone in the community, from the school janitor, to the neighborhood cop, to the corporate CEO, is trained to recognize and respond effectively to those at risk for suicide and ultimately prevent a needless death. This training program will help communities identify at-risk individuals, lower their risk factors, and finally raise protective factors to achieve zero suicide communities. To more fully understand these risk and protective factors, let's join Mary Lee for the next video segment. Thank you, Tanya. In this segment, we're gonna talk a little bit about what we do know about suicide. From a public health perspective, suicide is actually considered to be one of the most preventable of deaths. But it's a preventable death if we know and we understand risk factors. We support protective factors, those things that increase our resiliency, those things that increase our competency in dealing with the world. If we recognize warning signs, we also have to be trained and ready to do three things. And if you'll say the three things with me, ask about suicide, seek more information, and keep safe, and know where and how to refer. Thank you. I told you you'd have this memorized by the end of the day. You notice when we talk about risk factors, we have a rock climber as an example. Why do y'all think? Well, he's looking for something to hold on to. He may feel that life is a precipice. He has an uphill battle. Well, if something happens and he does slip, he has equipment to hold him up and keep him safe. What is at the end of that equipment? Uh, I'm not a rock climber, but I think it's another person. It's another Maybe. person. Normally, it's another person. So risk factors are stressful events, situations, or conditions in a person's life. Stressful events or conditions that can increase the likelihood, not cause, but increase the likelihood of a death by suicide. And you can have risk factors that are biopsychosocial. Do any of these speak to you or any of these things that, that you've seen? Lisa, you're nodding and... I think trauma in particular is a huge risk factor. Um, there's research that suggests trauma impacts brain development, and I've seen that in the youth that I've worked with where they have a really hard time regulating their emotions. And then we have somebody in the back table I know that, that works uh, in the hospital. Caroline, do you want to say anything about um, biopsychosocial? When we do assessments on our patients who are admitted, um, we look for all of these things, and um, we primarily see mental illness, a lot of substance abuse, family issues, trauma, impulsive, aggressive behavior. I mean, pretty much everything that's on there we see and we assess for those so that we know when we're planning for these people, we have to keep all this in mind so that they can be as successful as possible and be set up with um, things to help them in the future so they don't fall back onto this. Carolyn, thank you. So everything from mental illness and substance abuse uh, to one that's underlined at the end, and that is previous suicide attempt. Anybody that has attempted suicide at the past is exponentially at increased risk for the future. And there's some suicidologists that they talk about it almost in terms of, of you can think of it as, as a practice in the sense that um, you will become more likely to complete it. If, if you've done it in the past. So previous attempt, I, I want y'all to remember, is, is something that uh, really does increase uh, risk factors. But there's one takeaway here that, that I think it's important for all of us to share, and the takeaway is that 90%, I'm gonna say it again, 90% of those who die by suicide have an underlying mental health or substance abuse condition. Now, that condition may be undiagnosed, is it may be with a lot of the youth that you work with. It can be diagnosed but undertreated. We know that happens a lot with seniors because some of the things that cause, that, 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 um, cause somebody to, to be forgetful uh, may actually relate to depression 
rather than memory problems. And so quite often it's, it's mistreated or, or, or untreated. Underlying condition though, 90% have an underlying mental health or substance abuse condition. That doesn't always make the media, it doesn't, people will tend to look at the proximal risk factor. You know, student died because of bullying. Bullying may have been a contributing factor, but quite often if you, we had all the information, we would see an underlying uh, mental illness or substance use uh, disorder condition. So that's something that I, I want everybody to remember. Depression, bipolar, and schizophrenia have, are, are particular um, underlying conditions that we talk about when we talk about suicide. Uh, depression is what, the, the, the common cold of mental illness. But it's the common cold of mental illness that can turn into something very, very deadly. With bipolar, it's estimated that 20% of those who struggle with bipolar, 20% die by suicide. That's a really high rate, and 15% of those with schizophrenia. But I don't want to leave you with thinking that it's hopeless because it isn't. There's help, there's hope, there's things that you can do. Jennifer, are you comfortable telling your story? I was 13 when I tried to kill myself. Um, I have bipolar disorder and struggled with it through my teen and college years without any treatment. Um, I was bullied in high school and middle school. I also um, suffered from depressive episodes. And um, I saw the world as really black and white. I was either excelling or I was failing. And I failed at a lot more than I excelled at at the time, or at least I believed I did. Um, my parents had marital problems and weren't really there for me. So it all just kind of ballooned into an attempt one night after a fight with my mother. And luckily I survived. And I've continued on um, with treatment and found ways to um, support myself. And with friends and family, support system is huge. Um, having good friends and family members support you is vital. Um, and that's my story. And you're here and you and head I'm up the, the Youth First Behavioral Survey and help save other lives. I just yes. think your story is so powerful. And, and knowing you, I know how it's something that, that you manage like somebody else might manage diabetes. Correct. So I, I think that that's the story of help and hope that we need to hear. And thank you for sharing that. Sure. There are also social and cultural aspects that are underlying uh, risk factors like isolation. We've talked about isolation in, in terms of, of bullying could be isolating, GLBTQ could be, but it could also be something as that we might not think about, uh, someone who is obese and feels isolated, uh, someone who is gifted and talented, because quite often with the gifted and talented, we see uh, young people who are gifted intellectually, but perhaps not, not socially. So, so that can be another area. Stigma to seeking help. There is research that, that shows that half of the population isn't as quick to seek help as the other half. So um, that may be something that also contributes to the higher death rate of, of men by suicide is, is just that stigma against, against seeking help. Then there's, there's barriers to health and mental health care. And Shannon, you and I were talking over the break ab about some, some cultural um, uh, issues and some health disparities. Is there something you'd like to share with us about health disparities? Um, in Texas, we have a shortage of mental health professionals, period. But then when you look at the race and ethnicity, most folks, um, typically regardless of their race or ethnicity, say that they feel most comfortable working with a mental health professional who is of their race and ethnicity as well. Um, and unfortunately, there's not a lot of diversity within the mental health workforce. Shannon, um, thank you so much. I really appreciate that because I think it's something we need to be aware of. But you hit one key thing, and that is we have a shortage overall with mental health care. And, and I know, Greg, that's been a, an issue that, that NAMI has dealt with and will continue to deal with, and that's an issue that Mental Health America of Texas has, has dealt with. But we have a shortage of mental health care, and we have a shortage of funding. We, we're, we're something like 49th in the nation on spending on mental health care. So it's, it, it's almost a, a crisis point, I would say. 
environmental risk factors tend to be associated with loss, whether it be loss of a job, loss in terms of finances, loss in terms of loss of, of a loved one. It could also be loss uh, as, as somebody is getting older of, of loss of the ability to do some of the things that you might have done before, loss of, of sight, loss of hearing, loss of mobility. So loss is something that you're going to see across all aspects there, but there's one other thing I want to mention in terms of environment. What happens when, when, when there's a gastrointestinal cluster across a, a, a segment of the population? What, what, why, why do we know it's a cluster? What's going on? There's three key things. There's an association between person, place, and time. Association between person, place, and time. All the people that have the gastrointestinal illness somehow have some association with each other through person, place, or time. We also unfortunately see this with suicide, but it is only for young people. But it's young people through college age, and it would also hit some military. We don't know why, but the research shows that young people can be susceptible to something that's called a cluster or a contagion effect. So I want you to be aware of that because one of the things that we also do that is yet another training is called postvention, and it's what you do after a death by suicide to help prevent more deaths. So we treat suicide a little bit differently in terms of memorials, in terms of, of keeping schools to be a place for learning, and not uh, 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 offering support for students that are in grief, but not memorializing the grief process, memorializing by active memorials uh, rather, rather than allowing a downward spiral of grief. So there's just a little bit different way that we approach suicide, and I wanted to share that with you. Another thing I wanted to bring up that was on the previous slide was um, talking about suicide. A lot of, I think there's a common myth that if we talk about suicide, we're glamorizing it. We're giving other people ideas about it. We're making it this, this wonderful thing. Um, and I think that really keeps people from talking about it because the fear that it is going to be glamorizing it. And I'm glad you brought that up because it, it, we do need to talk about problems, whether it be suicide or something else, in order to deal with them. And it's very important, and that's a very, very common myth. But Associated with that is how we talk about it. So we always want to talk about it in terms of help and hope. So if, if you noticed, we had kind of had a, a heavy conversation about all the risk factors and the statistics, but then Jennifer shared her story of help and hope. You know, she's here. She learned to deal with it. She's reaching out to other people. So that is something that there has been a lot of research on. Madeline Gould has, has done a lot of the key research on it. Is the messaging we always want to um, add for suicide prevention is messages of help and hope along with, with the messages of this is a problem we have to deal with. So thank you, Caroline, so much for bringing that up. Protective factors are the positive conditions that can promote resiliency and can actually work to help prevent suicide. What are some of the things that comes to your mind when you think of protective factors? Family. Family. Access to services, uh, recreational activities. Access to recreational activities, access to things that are fun, that, that add joy to our life and joy that we can share with other people is certainly a part of, of resiliency. Um, and then this slide just goes through a number of different areas of resiliency that we don't always think about, but I know that Shannon mentioned earlier, and that's access to clinical care. Um, restricted access to lethal means, we've talked about a lot. Connections to family, Greg, you just brought up. Anything else here that, that, that you're, you're noticing? I think just having someone that you, you can talk to, that you're having a confidant, uh, that could be a family member, a friend, a teacher, a priest, or... Peter. Uh, a question, is there any um, equivalent of Alcoholics Anonymous to support people who are prone to depression or who would be prone to suicide, that they could actually come together and support each other? There is. There are a number of different groups, and one of them, uh, Greg's going to share with us because NAMI offers a number of different programs that do just what you're talking about. Yes, the NAMI Connection Support Group is offered free in many communities across the U.S. and abroad. 
NAMI Connections. And it, it's for individuals uh, with mental illness who would benefit from support from talking their issues out with people who have been in similar situations. And then I know some of our uh, local suicide prevention coalitions have uh, some attempt survivor groups that are uh, going strong. Jennifer, do you have any uh, specific areas you want to mention? I would mention a website, livethroughthis.org, um, which is tales of um, resiliency and people who have survived suicide attempts and how they've gotten on with their lives and continue to flourish. And that can give people a lot of hope. I've always liked the title, Live Through This. Live, I like the emphasis on that. We've talked a lot about risk factors and we've talked about protective factors. Protective factors can be something as simple as sharing a meal with each other. We know that families who share a meal on a daily basis tend to be more resilient. Protective factors can be involvement in community organizations, involvement with a faith community. Protective factors can be the sharing that we're doing right now. In suicide prevention, we want to lower risk factors and we want to raise protective factors. And that's something that I think we all have to look at in our community because too often we just talk about the risk factors and we don't talk about the protective factors. So please, as you go out in the community and as you work to be a suicide prevention gatekeeper, think about how you can connect to others Think about how you can connect communities to each other because that's what keeps us alive.